Back last year, after George Floyd was killed, we know that the entire country was up in arms about it, and many people were demanding action and change, including many CEOs and corporations. Now that a year has passed, the question is, did they make good on their promises? Did all of those pledges come to fruition? We're going to take a look at an article from the Financial Times that says, are CEOs living up to the pledges they made after George Floyd's murder? Promises were made about diversity and about racial justice. Well, those are uh, proved easier to make than they are to keep. Isn't that convenient? So here's another picture of George Floyd. This article was written by Andrew Edgecliff Johnson and Taylor Nichols Rogers down here from the Financial Times. Go give them a subscription if you like the content. The words systemic racism used to not be spoken on U.S. companies' earnings calls. Okay, so think about this. You work at a private corporation or a, a public corporation or a private business or whatever. The way that we're talking about interfacing with other people has changed dramatically. I'm going to talk to you here about a couple different charts. Sort of what is the consequence of everything that we went through the last year in our corporate worlds. We talked about this in the context of criminal law. We talked about this in the context of justice reform and our useless politicians. Now we're talking about this in terms of society and how is this all trickling down into our culture and into our daily lives, even in our workplaces. We remember, we've seen a lot of this stuff come to fruition in this context, talking about diversity. The murder of George Floyd, a black man killed by Chauvin, abruptly changed that, putting the phrase into the mouths of the country's top executives and forcing them to consider their part in a system they're now denouncing. We have Apple's Tim Cook. We have Dave Solomon of Goldman Sachs. They declared that business leaders need not only speak up, but they need to do more to address racial disparities in their own companies. An assessment of the changes they have made in the intervening period suggests that Floyd's death did catalyze corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, but on several key measures, much more needs to be done, including to turn executives' newly active rhetoric into a reality. American corporations, they pledged to spend $50 billion on racial equity. And you remember this, right? Remember, we, we, we've seen sort of a slow transition here. We saw a lot of this start with uh, Colin Kaepernick. Then we saw Nike sort of go all in on that message. We've seen Coca-Cola. People were joking. They're called Woca-Cola. And so the list goes on and on. You see boycotts and you see a lot of you know, corporations sort of jumping into the political fray, leaving many of us to go, oh, let's, all right, we're going we're gonna to get political now with the corporations. We're going to see how that works. But uh, $50 billion is a significant amount of money. The funds were to be spread between donations to civil rights organizations and targeted investments in communities of color and overhauls of their internal recruiting and training programs. Yet only about $250 million has actually been spent or committed. $250 million out of $50 billion. Okay. Tiny little fraction. $50 billion is a lot of money. This is what the vocabulary looks like. This is what happened. Remember this happened May 25th, right about this time. George Floyd changed how corporate America speaks, changed the vocabulary. Mentions of systemic racism and Black Lives Matter at company events. This is what happened. This is the, the pink here is BLM. So as soon as George Floyd died, major spike. And it's been flowing ever since. Same here with systemic racism. Boom. All over the place. Spiking up, still around and in existence. Now, the question is... You know, is this is this doing much of anything? Is this just a bunch of people just talking about making some meaningful changes, about creating some equity or equality, or is this just a bunch of bloviating from corporate shills, as is usually the case? Well, we know that employers are happy talking about some things, but not other things. Let's see if we can dissect why that might be. So from this same article, it says that employers are happier disclosing anti-bias training then they are about pay. So if they're talking about, you know, about we've got we've got a very unequal society in America. We're all a bunch of racist white patriarchs that were birthed, emerged from original sin, tainted by the stink of slavery back in the 1600s when America started to get its feet under herself. So how do we correct that problem? I'm a Fortune 500 CEO. I know what a piece of garbage I am. I got to fix the scales in America. What do I do? Well, I can do one thing. I can just 
give everybody raises, I can just say, well, you know, we've been uh, pretty racist here at this country for the last 50 years. So we're going to just go ahead and, and give some version of reparations or something. We're going to give the, the, the plighted people benefits in the forms of monetary compensation. It's one way to do it, right? And these corporations could do that. Do they want to do that? No, of course not. They don't want to do any of that. They want to talk about education and training programs, <laughs> okay? So employers are happier disclosing anti-bias training plans than they are pay. No, they don't want to talk about pay equity. That's down here at the bottom. Nobody wants to talk about that. But we can talk about education and training programs. We can talk about community investments because, well, first of all, we know that we're not going to have to make any of those. We, we pledged $50 billion where we only gave $250 million, So you're all a bunch of suckers who, who printed that. So we're just going to say this a lot, and we know that we're only going to have to deliver about this much of it. Then we've got uh, racial and ethnic diversity data. So that's easy for them. They just go to their HR department, and we just run some numbers. Oh, we got some you know low numbers over here, so we're going to beef that up. So that causes, it really, they don't have to do anything about that that then a response to mass incarceration so what are these companies going to do about any of that nothing they're just going to kick it over to the politicians who are also not going to do anything about it and so they can just talk about this all day long so most of these are actually just totally meaningless they don't do anything but they can talk about it and they can pledge a bunch of money and they can sort of cause some incensed division in this country by puffing up a bunch of uh, 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 politically volatile stories that make them sort of feel good about themselves without actually doing anything meaningful to rectify some of the imbalances that they're claiming exist. Now, I'm not buying any of their premises. I don't believe the premises, but they're their premises. I mean, they're the people who came out and said this. Well, we're, we're going to commit $50 billion to uh, uh, solving racial disparity in this country. Okay, well, where is your money? Well, it's a good question. What we want to focus on is education and training programs. Oh, okay. And community investments. Got it. Good for you. It's a nice grift. Very, very nice grift. A few of these platforms have used their power more forcefully. We have an economist who's the director of 3M and Chevron. So she said, we are demanding much more responsibility and accountability around subcontractors. So she said the company she works for were scrutinizing, scrutinizing whether accountants, law firms, and headhunters were sufficiently diverse. Listen to this. This is, this is great. Coca-Cola went public with a demand in January. They told U.S. law firms that they must commit within 18 months to having at least 30% of their billable hours be from diverse attorneys, half of whom must be black. <laughs> so Coca-Cola calls up our law firm and says, hey guys, um, well, we don't want you working on our stuff anymore uh, unless a third of your office is black. So, you know, I'm not going to share with you the demographics of our firm, of course, but if we didn't have that or if we needed to get that, then what would we do? I guess we would just fire some white people and go find some black people so that we could stay, keep a client called Coca-Cola if, if they were our client. Like, is that what they're asking law firms to do? Go fire the white folks at your firm. Go hire some black people because we're not going to do business with you unless you do that. Okay, that's Coke. If they want to do that, I guess I guess they're entitled. It, that, that sounds racist as hell to me, but what do I know? On current trends, black lawyers could not expect to be equitably represented among law firm partners until 2391, <laughs> said Coke's general counsel at the time. So they're going to fix that. He said, we have developed scorecards. We've held summits. We've established committees. We've written action plans. These efforts are not working. Weeks after sending the letter and just eight months into his job, however, Gaten had stepped back into a consulting role. <laughs> Poor idiot. He has no idea what he's doing. Asked whether Gaten's diversity demand remained in place. The company said only that his successor would take time to thoughtfully review its initiatives. So the guy, the guy sends this letter. And he, to a bunch of law firms and you have a bunch of lawyers go, oh, that, that sounds like discrimination to me. Sounds like that might be a little a violation of the equal protection rules under the Employment Discrimination Act. And you've got all these employment lawyers going, oh, this will be fun. So uh, not a good decision to sort of send a racist uh, <laughs> request to a bunch of law firms that have a bunch of lawyers who know how the law works. Not going to work out for you when you do that. So that guy got promoted and went right back down to a consultant. We Thanks for the consultation. We're not going to be needing any more of that. <laughs> so it's just, oh my gosh, which is kind of why I have so much fun with this topic. It's like, it, it's such a ridiculous thing. You know, these people who, who think this way and operate this way and try to act this way, 
it doesn't work. They're going to run themselves into different circles and they're just going to explode under the weight of their own idiocy. It's like a black hole collapsing in on itself. There's just so much bad idea happening in one vicinity. It's just, oh, it's just going to collapse in itself, which is fine. It means we just have to sit here and watch as this whole thing crumbles before our very eyes. Now, we also know that the, uh, the, the feds are trying to get involved in some of this as well. So we're talking about corporations like Coke and uh, you know, the NFL and the NBA and all of these ba big major organizations. But our federal government now is also uh, kind of inserting our money into this conversation. Very strange. We see this article here published over from Fox News, Fox Business, says that the wokeness at the Fed's regional banks puts central bank independence at risk. So what does wokeness and racial justice and any of this stuff have to do with the Federal Reserve banks? Well, regional banks are taking an, uh, taking an increasingly alarming stance on politically charged issues like racial justice, according to Senator Pat Toomey, a Republican from Pennsylvania. Federal Reserve banks in Atlanta, Boston, Minneapolis recently dedicated resources to social policy reflecting the political leanings of officials who are neither elected nor confirmed by the Senate. Federal Reserve's mission statement mandates that the central bank to achieve maximum employment and stable prices. Experience has shown that countries with independent banks achieve better outcomes, yeah. Pursuing a highly politicized social agenda unrelated to monetary policy is inflicting reputational damage on the banks, said Senator Toomey. Three banks recently spearheaded a series that will be participated in by all 12 regional banks, which is centered on the belief that racism forms the foundation of inequality in our society. The, re the Racism and Economy series highlighted a number of topics, including structural racism in housing, education, and label markets. Atlanta Fed president, who is the first black Fed president on Monday, said that uh, should he become Fed chairman, he would steer the central bank towards economic inclusivity and equity. Can you believe this? The Federal Reserve chairman is going to push the Federal Reserve Bank towards economic inclusivity and equity. Folks, that is code word for like Marxism. Exactly right there, which is scary. Earlier this year, he said that we uh, that there are definitely merits to reparations and called the changes to Georgia voting laws troubling. That came last year after he published a letter said a moral and economic imperative to end racism. So this guy is just a stone's throw away from the, from the Fed chair. Minneapolis Fed, meanwhile, in 2020, renewed its commitment to dismantling systemic racism. It said that, that the, the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were the racist roots of the country. Toomey asked all three banks to provide documents on their recent racial justice activism. Good for him. Good for Senator Toomey for getting that stuff says it falls outside their scope no later than june 7th good for him hats off to senator toomey they said we received an inquiry from toomey's office about better understanding how we're using racial inequality with the federal reserve spokesman for both of them declined to comment the politicization of this and the so-called wokeism has been seeping into governmental departments corporate boardrooms and universities across america as biden pushes the plan to combat systemic racism, which is a stain on our nation's soul, he says. Biden later said he doesn't think that American people are racist. That's good. White House has said that Biden would, the White House has not said if Biden would sign a reparations bill should one pass through Congress. Well, maybe somebody should ask him, would you sign that, Joe? Yes or no? We got to move quickly through these questions. Doctor says, recently senators presented amendments to put baseball's antitrust status with the federal government. MLB claimed that the Georgia's legislation clearing up the voting laws after 2020 was racist. Since these corporations are political now, they should no longer enjoy special treatment. I agree with that. If they're going to be political, we should treat them the same way as we do all political organizations. Sharon Quinney says, in all this talk about BLM racial equity, trying to outwoke each other, the corporations are just taking out a form of insurance against vandalism and future repercussions in the event of a Marxist takeover. We have Nadar Blasir says, you know what is even more worthless than paying for all these woke programs? Carbon credits. These things are the biggest con on the planet once you look into it for more than five minutes. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on. So the feds are now getting involved in this this wokeism game which means it might be a good idea to just kind of maybe think about some alternative currencies which 
By the way, I have a new crypto channel, which is down below. Let's take a quick look at the freedom markets. These are the freedom indices because there, there's no wokeness going on here. Bitcoin is kind of hovering around 37,000. We've got Ethereum's about 2,600. No, no real major changes. You can see still on an uptrend really in all of these markets. We've got the uh, Cardano is looking pretty good, a buck 59 right now. We have Solana is doing well also. That's about $30. This has been trending down all day. So, you know, that might be worth worth taking a look at. We have uh, ICP, which I just made a video about this one down here. So ICP, very interesting protocol. I made a video on the crypto channel about this protocol specifically. It's it's th This is supposed to replace the entire internet uh, at some point in the future. And it looks like oh, we got some, a little bit, got a little bit of a, of, of, uh, upswing right there. We got Dogecoin is in the house. That is still falling. We've got Shibu Inu, which is the another meme coin. And then we have Litecoin, which is a staple. So, you know, if the Fed is going to be going woke, there are other ways where you can spend your time that don't involve woke American dollars. Put them in crypto. And all those questions came over from watching the watchers.locals.com. You can see this here. Welcome to Lonnie Holcomb. Welcome to the community, my friend. I'm glad that you are here and with us. And if you are not already a part of the community, you can join up and you can get a copy of my book for free. It's called Beginning to Winning How to Fight Your Case and Succeed in the Criminal Justice System. You can also download a copy of the slides that we went through today, a copy of my impeachment party documents, download my personal productivity system called Existence Systems. We share links throughout the day and you meet a lot of great people we met a lot of great people on our last monthly zoom meetup we had about 35 people on super fun want to show you when our next one is we had our last one on may 22nd which was last weekend next one's coming up june 26th if you're a member at watching the watchers.locals.com you get in on that for free no charge you also get the chance or the the, the it's, it's free just need you to come to it it's on saturday june 12th we're doing law enforcement interaction training so we're going to spend about an hour and a half talking about how this all works and then we'll take some questions and just kind of hang out for the last half hour we're gonna spend two hours saturday morning for me 9 a.m 12 p.m or 12 noon eastern time for those of you uh, on the east coast and one last thing i happen to be a criminal defense lawyer in scottsdale arizona and so if you know anybody in the state of arizona who has been charged with the crime we would be honored and humbled if you sent them our direction we offer free case evaluations. We can help with any type of criminal charge, even traffic charges. We can help with any time that you're in trouble with the law. We are the people to call. And so we would really appreciate your referrals and any love that you send our way. All of the contact information is down in the link in the description below. Quick reminder, if you're watching this and you're not subscribed to this channel, go ahead and subscribe. We would love to see you here back uh, on future shows. I have a list of some of the other channels where some of my other content is now coming out. So if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you to go check those out as well. As many of you know, YouTube has not been nice to us on this channel. And so um, we're sort of diversifying a little bit and segmenting the content out. So if you want to follow along, that's the place to do that. And then uh, that is it, my friends. We're going to be back here same time, same place tomorrow, 4 p.m. Arizona time, 5 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. on the East Coast for that one Florida man. Everybody have a tremendously lovely evening. Sleep very well. I'll see you here tomorrow. Bye-bye.